That's the smart thing to say when somebody asks you about how you get your media. That is, if you're a pirate. But what if you're not? Or better yet, what if you don't want to be? DMCA, otherwise known as the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, passing through the Senate on October the 12th, 1998, and then signed into law on the 28th, has been the backbone for many changes to the internet over the last 17 years. If you have ever heard about a DMCA tech down, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. It has also been the foundation for the creation of DRM. What is DRM? Well, DRM is short for Digital Rights Management, which basically covers any methods used by copyright holders to protect their digital content. This can be found in games or software and, of course, video. DRM is a thorn in your side if you ever want or have a media server. That brings me to my topic, how to get movies and TV shows for your media server. In today's video, I will be covering different methods people use, but will also disclose the inherited risk with each one. This is in no way meant to be a tutorial on how to steal media, and I in no way support piracy in general. All of my videos are for demonstrational purposes only, and thus should only be used as informational tools. So let's start off with the squeaky clean way of having your own media server. If I wanted to throw an arbitrary number related to the risk involved here, I would say that these methods are a zero out of 10, meaning of course that there should be no way you can get in trouble by doing this. Archive.org, the number one source on the internet for anything that's been released to the public free of copyrights. Now, you're not going to find the latest Batman movie here. I mean, this is mainly a spot for media that has either been created with the intention of being copyright free, or it's so old that it no longer holds any value. So if you happen to want to watch the original Wizard of Oz from 1910, this might be the place for you. Throughout this site, you can easily find download links that you can use to build your own media library if you should choose to. But let's be honest, unless you're born in the early 1900s, you probably won't find many of these interesting. Let's step the risk up just a little and turn to DRM-free content that can be purchased from online. The biggest example here would be Vimeo.com, who will sometimes allow you to download a digital copy after your purchase that you can use in your media server. On the risk scale, this could be a 1 out of 10, mainly because you did buy it and you didn't have to crack any DRM to use it, but you could still get in trouble if you shared it with your friends. Keep in mind that not everything you buy can be downloaded, but it is still a good source to start with. Then there's Voto.net. This site offers free or cheap indie films that you can download via torrent, most of which though are only short films, and they're not going to be the same quality that you would get from Hollywood, but they're not really meant to. And lastly, look out for some stand-up comedians who offer similar download options, again, without any DRM. Louis C.K. is one of the few who offer this on his website. I will link in the description a full list of places to download media from this category. If you are still one of the few people out there that hold on to the age-old method of media consumption and still have a cable TV subscription, you could obtain movies and TV shows directly from this. Now, doing this can be a little tricky and could require some extra hardware. So I'm going to put this at a risk level of, let's say, 3 out of 10, mainly because you're paying for the video stream and DVRs already exist everywhere, so it's nothing new. But you can still share it with other people and get yourself in trouble. Okay, you might have a DVR that records stuff for you that you could directly download off the hard drive when you want to store it. That kind of depends on the DVR though. Or you could have a TV turner inside your computer that's coupled with recording software that will store them directly to your PC. You could even get a video capture card on your PC that will do the same thing. Keep in mind that some of these options could require a little bit of editing. For example, if you record from a capture card, you might have to go through them and take out all of the commercials before you add it to your server. I mean, unless you like commercials. Moving on to a more popular method, we get ripping DVDs or Blu-ray disc. On my risk scale of 1 to 10, I give this option a solid 4. Reason being is that even though you technically own the media, ripping it to a digital format requires you to break DRM, usually. And technically, that's illegal. I don't consider this a very high risk because you're not downloading it from the internet and thus you have no risk of Hollywood hitmen finding out about it. You can still break the law though if you end up sharing that with some of your friends or your family. It's funny because if you were to actually drive your DVD over to your friend's house to watch it, you wouldn't be breaking any laws. But if you were to digitally stream it, well, Hollywood gets a lawsuit boner and tries to throw you in jail. Because America.
There are many Blu-ray and DVD ripping software options available. If you happen to live in a country where this option might be legal, I recommend you go into Google and do a search on the top five rippers. I will throw a link in the description though. Keep in mind that DVD and Blu-ray ripping can be a very long and demanding process. You will need a decent hard drive and up to two or more hours depending on your computer just to get one movie. Ripping a movie requires you to not only decode it from the disc, but you also have to re-encode it to a smaller, more usable format. MKV and MP4 seem to be the most dominant video containers using the encoding of X264. These could yield a file size ranging from 2 to 12 gigabytes per movie. Now, of course, these are just average numbers. I mean, it primarily depends on how long the movie or TV show is and what quality options you chose. If you really wanted to, you could get a movie all the way down to less than a gigabyte or over 45 gigabytes. If I were you, though, I would aim for 8 to 10 gigabyte range. That just kind of seems to be the video quality sweet spot. Mileage may vary. Going a little higher on the risk scale with a rating of 6, we have Usenet. Usenet is a very old concept of delivering news and digital media from private servers dating all the way back to 1980. You usually have to pay to be a part of this network now, but you get access to a large number of websites that are otherwise inaccessible to the outside world. While there are many sites that allow open downloading, there are still more private, invite-only sites that offer faster speeds and releases. This is actually where a lot of movies are released to initially before they hit mainstream torrents. I only give this a 6 out of 10 because it still runs the risk of being detected by your ISP, but because of the method of direct delivery and the format of the files, the risk is extremely low. Most Usenets will provide you with a large number of smaller compressed files with non-obvious names. Because of this, it's hard to detect it as an actual movie file. Let's not forget about IRC. IRC has been around since 1988 and is still used today, but it runs off of a chat style room where you can actually join and request files. Usually you get put in a queue to wait for somebody else to complete their download, and then the room bot will send you the file directly. This method could run a higher risk because of the more public exposure you get when you're looking for the movies. Let's go ahead and give this a 7 out of 10 on my arbitrary risk scale, mainly because of the exposure and sometimes obvious names of the files. Sharing a similar risk level, we have private FTPs that have been used before and they may still exist today. These run a high risk for the host because the server being ran off of one dedicated or set of dedicated IPs become easily traceable. That's why they can be found on computers with fast connections that have been compromised and turned into a host without the owner knowing. But even then, if someone really wanted to trace people who connected to the server after it was found out, it could be done. With all of these risks involved, private FTP servers are hardly used. You may or may not have heard about most of these methods, some of them bringing in more risk than others, but still illegal and could land you some hefty fines or even time in jail. One method that I almost say 95% of you have heard about is torrenting. Torrents came to life back in 2001 and have since become one of the most widely used methods of transferring pirated digital content to others. Unfortunately, this has given it a bad name and most people associate torrenting with pirates because of it. Truth is though that the torrent protocol itself offers many benefits to legal users and companies who want to distribute large files without the huge cost of bandwidth. For example, we have updates to games, project files, uncompressed images from NASA, released government documents, file syncing, Linux ISOs. I mean, the list can go on. But the hard fact is that pirates primarily use it to steal and share digital content. With all of this said, I give torrenting a solid 10 out of 10 on my arbitrary risk scale. Reason being is that when you connect to a torrent, you connect to a vast network of other users who are downloading and uploading the same exact file that you are after. Any number of these users can be owned by the authorities or copyright holders, and if you happen to request any package from them, they will log your IP and then pursue legal action. I won't go into detail on how torrents work, but if you happen to understand it, then you can agree that the chance of this happening is pretty high. Some of the bigger, most widely known torrent sites would be the Pirate Bay, Kick-Ass Torrents, or Torrent Leech. All of these are known to everybody, so you have a very high chance of getting caught if you use them. Some users are members of smaller, lesser known websites though, that not only require an invite to join, but are usually never talked about publicly and always maintain a small community. This lowers the risk a little, but like anything, it can be compromised. Torrents are the easiest way to build a large collection of media with all of the latest movies and TV shows, but they carry a huge risk that could involve very large fines or even time in jail. I recommend you avoid stealing content this way like it's the plague. A night at home with the latest movie is never worth going to jail over. 
And yes, to all you elite internet pirates, I understand that you've probably been using torrents for years and you've never had any problems, or you know 30 people have been doing the exact same thing, never been caught, etc., etc. This isn't the place to whip out your EPIN, so please keep it in your pants. All I'm doing is explaining how these things work and how they are viewed by the law. And yes, methods do exist that can significantly lower your risk level for many of these options. One of the most basic ways is using a program called PeerBlock. PeerBlock is basically a large database of known IPs that are owned by the, either the law or copyright holders that's used to block any and all connections to those computers while torrenting. This is in no way a foolproof method to keeping yourself safe, but it is still a layer of protection. And then you have VPNs. A VPN will tunnel all of your internet traffic through a single secure IP address shared by thousands of users. So the connection between you and the VPN cannot be sniffed by your ISP, and any connections from the VPN to the outside world is from a public IP. So if you are torrenting behind a VPN, the internet hitman would see you as using the same connection as a thousand other people are. A good VPN service won't record any logs and might even offer anonymous payment options like Bitcoin. This rabbit hole of cloaking your online activity can go deeper, but that's really not the point of this video, so I'm just going to stop here. I hope you found this video informative and it gave you some insight on the different methods people use to obtain media for their servers. Remember, this is for informational use only, and I in no way condone or encourage people using any illegal methods on their own. Building a media server can be a lot of fun, but you should make sure to do it the right way. As always, if you like this video, show a little love, click the like button below. And if you want to hear more, don't forget to subscribe.